Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, IDRA January 2022 issue web discussion. My name is Liza Weinstein. I'm an associate professor of sociology at Northeastern University in Boston and an editor at the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. And it is my pleasure today to gather together um, some of the authors, many of the authors um, from the January issue and um, to host a discussion today on really timely and important themes of populism and right-wing political imaginaries. This discussion that we're gonna to have today will build on, but will aim to not duplicate um, the, uh, the rich uh, conversations and articles that were had in IGER's January issue, um, which was comprised of four uh, uh, interventions pieces and five rich articles um, that you, most of which you will get a chance to hear from today. Unfortunately, two um, authors for two of our papers were unable to be here to present today, but we will have um, uh, seven of the articles, I think. We'll, we'll see as we um, as the conversation unfolds. So I um, I will the the plan of events today will be that the authors will each introduce themselves and will provide brief introductions to the article to the arguments in their articles or papers, and um, and then I will offer some brief commentary and um, conversation, you know, some, some questions to launch our conversation, but we have uh, structured today's discussion so that we have the majority of time set aside for audience questions. So hopefully you have had a chance to read the January article, the January issue, but if you have not yet had a chance to read, I am sure that the, the presentations will give you a lot to think about and will um, be a nice launching pad for today's discussion. So um, please um, use the Q&A um, at any time during the presentations today to drop questions in um, the Q&A box, and I will um, be curating the questions and be um, posing them to the authors after their presentations. So I would like to um, uh, hand the, the virtual mic to Nina Ebner, who will be um, introducing her paper today. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nina Ebner. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UT Austin. Thanks so much to Liza and Eshna for organizing this event. Um, the title of the article that I will introduce briefly today is Fantasy Island, Paul Romer and the Multiplication of Hong Kong. Along with Jamie Peck, also present on this panel. Centered around Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Romer and his idea of charter cities, our paper explores the resilience and persistence of particular neoliberal urban development imaginaries, despite their unfounded hubris and repeated failures in practice. We track the ways that these imaginaries are conceptualized by a diverse set of actors across the center-right spectrum and attempts to implement them, in this case, in the form of protracted efforts to create charter cities in a post-coup Honduras. To do so, we got creative with methods and sources, which included TED Talks, podcasts, media sources, interviews, and dialoguing reciprocally with existing great ethnographic research. Charter cities have been described as special economic zones on steroids. They are neo-colonial visions of startup urbanism, territorial enclaves founded on you know, ostensibly empty land, governed by, governed by free market rules modeled on idealized versions of colonial Hong Kong. According to charter city advocates, pro-corporate and market-friendly development is catalyzed through the application of superior systems of governance, better rules guaranteed by a foreign state, preferably a so-called developed one. Despite their failure to launch in practice, charter cities are exemplary of the resilient political capacities of neoliberal networks and policy formations, in particular those that are built around a development fantasy of Hong Kong not the Hong Kong of either actual history or the contested present, but the Hong Kong of the free market imagination, an idealized site for efficiently administered and lightly regulated capitalism. This is a fantasy that unites the fundamentalist fringe of the free market right from libertarians to Reaganites to crypto neoliberals to conservative government officials in the Americas and beyond, made more palatable in this case by Paul Romer's media-friendly brand of applied urban economics. Just Google his TED Talks. 
despite their framing as a radical new urban development model with the potential to resolve economic and immigration crises in the so-called developing world, charter cities should instead be understood as repackaged versions of the deregulated market enclave. Furthermore, in the context of Honduras, they, may also, they must also be situated as part of a long history of colonial and corporate land grabs. The Black Fraternal Organization of Honduras branded the effort to create charter cities as colonialism 2.0, even likening Romer to a mafia godfather. Finally, efforts to build a Hong Kong of the Caribbean in Honduras also illuminate the relegation of sites in the so-called global south to zones of experimentation. The prevailing ethos, both of pushers of these development imaginaries and of elite Western media, is why not give it a try if things are so bad already? That's it for me. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic over to Ryan. Thank you, Nina. Um, our paper uh, is called Everyday Roma Stigmatization, Racialized Urban Encounters, Collective Histories, and Fragmented Habitus. And it's a co-authored paper with Remus, Peter, and Baklavoa, um, all here today as well. And uh, the, the article is based on Roma communities within um, Chechia and Romania. And the main argument of our article is in response to what we would see as an, an overemphasis on relations with the state and understandings of the um, racialized positioning of, of Roma within the two contexts. It's a brilliant work in that, in that area, some outstanding scholarship which has illuminated our um, understanding there. But we saw um, much less work on the kind of micro settings of the urban and the, the way in which um, stigmatization manifests in the everyday, in the, the relational and in the, the specific materialities of, um, of, of the urban. Um, so we brought together this idea of um, racialized urban encounters with the, the collective histories of this long-term, very peculiar long-term Roma outsider status and very long-term, long dispossession within Romania as it's often preferred, for example, and how these encounters had much more to them than a meeting beyond the, the, the ephemeral, um, and how they opened up a whole new kind of register of ways of inhabiting um, an outsider position for Roma. Um, and so we kind of reject the binary of the um, it, either the internalization of Roma versus the um, the internalization of, of stigma versus the resistance to it. We find instances where the two coexist, but we also find a much, much broader and wider register of in-betweens and nuances in how Roma respond. So we, um, we, we tentatively point towards the potentialities of this in, in terms of um, of collectives and um, a kind of emotional endurance, if you like, that allows Rome to navigate difficult um, circumstances. But we say tentatively because it's um, far removed from the kind of transformative potentialities that we might associate with some of the work on urban encounters. So what we do is we call for more attention to this um, um, in aiding our appreciation of how stigmatization is not only produced and perpetuated through generations, but how it's maintained a whole range of different scales. And over to you, Louisa. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Liza, for organizing this. Hello, everyone. I'm Luisa Sotomayor, an associate professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University in Toronto. And the co-authors in this paper are Juan Rivero, and Juliana Sanoto, who centered regrets and can be with us today, and Andrew Sitzer, who is an associate professor at Drexel University and will participate in the discussion section. So he is here with us already. Um, our paper is titled Democratic Public or Populist Rubble, Repositioning the City Amidst Social Fracture. I'll start by providing some background to our paper. This intervention emerged from a mini conference connected to the meeting of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning that took place in 2018, so it's been a few years now. Um, and all our discussions and the writing for this paper occurred pre-COVID, yet mostly on Zoom. The mini conference asked whether the increasingly tenuous distinction between a democratic public and a populist rabble 
particularly since the election of right-wing populist leaders like Donald Trump or Jair Bolsonaro, called for a reconsideration of urban planning's normative commitment to community deliberation as a common source of knowledge and legitimacy in this field. The paper elaborates on some of the discussions that came out of that conference, of which actually Abigail participated as well, and she, she's following after me, by exploring the various, and that was a parenthesis, by exploring the various interrelated causes driving the growing degree of social fracture and the prevalence of populist movements transnationally. It did consider the role that cities might play in countering these dynamics. We identified the following factors as driving the current crisis. So first, economic restructuring, rising inequality, and an ensuing democratic deficit. Uh, second, cultural divisions exacerbated by a multifaceted crisis of representation. And third, a breakdown in communication across difference arising from disparate ontological and epistemological assumptions. In considering a response by urban practitioner, in this paper, we also thought of ways in which cities might work best as sites of political encounter and experimentation. And there is a, an incredible scholarship to illuminate uh, that, that helped us in illuminating this point. And it, we are proposing this by enabling both a re-examination of prevailing modes of public engagement and the emergence of solidarities and infrastructures through which populism might be challenged. We drew inspiration from recent examples that range from the social urbanism program adopted in Medellin to transnational networks developed as part of local-based activism against predatory equity in Harlem, New York. We presented those, however, more as illustrations of the untapped potential of urban practices in confronting populism than as templates to follow. So we're hopeful yet uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, we end with, with a call and an invitation to try to, uh, to look for those solidarities and those type of infrastructures where, uh, popul uh, through which populism might be challenged. Thank you, and now over to you, Abigail. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, my name is Abigail Friendly, and I'm an assistant professor um, at Utrecht University in the Department of Human Geography and Spatial Planning. Um, and my paper is entitled Insurgent Planning in Pandemic Times, the Case of Rio de Janeiro. So this paper was written in the context of the first wave of the pandemic in uh, 2020. Um, and it reflects the case of Brazil where Jair Bolsonaro's far right populist government came to power in 2018, facilitated by the perception of a crisis in connection to ongoing corruption scandals a failing economy and social polarization. So from the beginning of the pandemic, it was quite clear that Bolsonaro's populist approach could be damaging for communities across Brazil and for informing policy on the pandemic. So for that reason, the paper focuses on the leadership by communities themselves under a populist context, drawing on literature on insurgent planning, practices that are counter-hegemonic, transgressive and imaginative. So in reaction to the state failure that I show in the paper, Favela communities across Brazil um, began implementing creative local solutions to deal with this. And as the pandemic developed, Bolsonaro insisted, for example, that uh, COVID-19 is just a little flu. He called it media hysteria and refused to impose stronger um, measures to fight the pandemic. He claimed that people could just continue with their daily lives and fake uh, news made it increasingly difficult for people to understand the need to isolate. So drawing on the role of cities in these kind of growing populist moments, um, following, following on what Louisa said in, in, in her paper and very much dealing with, uh, dealing with the context that they raised, um, I, I argue that the Brazilian government's political articulation during the pandemic, including, for example, rejecting the use of masks, championing untested treatments on television, denying evidence of the threat of the virus, reinforces its existing populist stance, fostering polarization through disinformation among residents in Brazilian peripheries. So in these contexts, uh, I argue that we need to take insurgent planning seriously as a practice that actually confronts the state and state inaction. So I ask, can planning be transformative? And I look at one case in Rio, Complexo da Maré. It's, it's, a, it's a collection of 16 favelas in Rio's North Zone. So in mid-March of 2020, Maré, um, communicators began countering government inaction with information, solidarity, and self-organization overall, uniting what were actually existing colectivos or collectives under the name Frenchie de Mobilisation da Maré, and I'll refer to them as Frenchie. 
communicators have actually been active in Mare and other communities uh, for some time, and they've been involved in organized struggles against human rights and social justice uh, abuses, acting as really platforms for political action. But during the pandemic, these insurgent practices by communicators came together in a moment of crisis, and they uni united those existing movements in a new form and gained considerable visibility. Um, communicators called attention to the need for local solutions with accessible language, adapting information to Mare's local reality, uh, posting banners around the community, calling attention to the importance of hand washing and staying at home. Um, they also um, produced a lot announcements broadcast from cars and they encouraged residents to share water and solidarity. They fostered uh, public policy debates about the need for prevention and distributed food and hygiene products. So performing these kinds of state-like function, these organized counter narratives situate the favela as the protagonist in that narrative. And as a result, they framed the issue around rights that oppose state failure. And I show in the paper that these acts by communicators are very political, confronting the Brazilian state and its irresponsibility to residents um, in favelas, especially during the pandemic. So one Frenchy member told me that this work goes, goes against the grain of the Brazilian government as the Brazilian government does not see us as part of the city. Um, these political acts by Frenchy are key to unsettling a normalized order and highlighting the role overall of insurgent planning. So the, seeing the case from the context of the pandemic highlights that insurgent citizenship is possible even under very, very difficult situations such as this one, but also that the context might even provoke, provoke an emergence of, of new forms of insurgent citizenship. And even though these kinds of, or some forms of collective act, actions um, existed considerably before the pandemic, these actions reflect a reconfiguration of what I would say are uh, political forms from those before the pandemic. So I'll leave it at that and I, I uh, pass the floor to Danielle, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Danielle Zoe Rivera. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture and environmental planning at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'll be discussing my intervention article, Disaster Colonialism, a commentary on disasters beyond single events to structural violence. Um, so initially I wrote this article to elevate Puerto Rican concerns that following hurricanes Irma and Maria in uh, 2017, the narrative surrounding the profound devastation uh, from these hurricanes was not being told by Puerto Ricans themselves. So with the uh, Verano Boricua in the summer of uh, 2019, which was a series of very powerful protests that led to the resignation of then governor Ricardo Rosillo, uh, I felt the Puerto Rican perspective was sorely needed in academic discourse surrounding disaster recovery and reconstruction. Uh, and their roles in what I've referred to in other writings uh, is known as procedural vulnerability. So this had, um, the article had two main orientations that I'll cover very briefly here. So first is that um, discussions of post Irma and Maria Puerto Rico need to be grounded in Puerto Rican theories of space, politics and environment. As such, I build my arguments with the grounding of environmental colonialism, uh, which is an endogenous theory um, in Puerto Rico um, surrounding uh, environmental justice versus uh, the continuing sort of emphasis on disaster colonialism, which I see as um, exogenous to Puerto Rico. Um, environmental colonialism itself is a series of grassroots movements that stretch back to at least the 1960s in Puerto Rico. Um, and its goal was to unearth the role, um, expose the role of colonial US power in the creation and maintenance of localized environmental risks, oftentimes um, point sources of pollution. This was by all accounts an early manifestation of organizing for environmental justice that took as its primary target the systems of colonialism and coloniality that persisted in Puerto Rico for over 500 years now. Uh, the result of emphasizing environmental colonialism is a reorientation towards Puerto Rican uh, histories and theories, one that exists well before and beyond the debt crisis, which is oftentimes what is most mentioned in disaster colonialism literature. Uh, from this, we can see, or sorry, disaster capitalism literature. Uh, from this, we can see how repeated colonialism and its resultant coloniality of being, or what Deborah Bird Rose called deep colonizing, operates through environmental risks and hazards to create rampant environmental injustices. So from this, building off of it, we have a second reorientation um, that asks how acute shocks, so major disasters like hurricanes, similarly operate in the service of colonialism and coloniality. 
So it's here where I propose the concept of disaster colonialism to make explicit the functions and intentions of repeatedly poor disaster recovery and reconstruction in colonized states such as Puerto Rico. It's important to note that colonialism here is not used metaphorically, but is meant to address a very real and contemporary state of existence. Uh, and since the publication of the article, I've noticed that disaster colonialism has been applied elsewhere as more of a theoretic framework or a metaphor. And it's not that, it's the explicit naming and identification of real procedural injustices endured over longer periods, longer periods of time in highly disaster prone regions. And we have evidence of such repeated injustices in Puerto Rico. Uh, one of the things the article does is it takes a look at the history of hurricanes uh, throughout the region and tries to actually map and identify what has happened after all of these different hurricanes. Um, and so from this disaster colonialism is really that idea of compounding disaster, relentless use of disaster to render indigenous, um, sorry, indigenous political uh, and social systems weak. So overall, my hope is that the concept of disaster colonialism can help us understand that disaster capitalism, which is so often referred to as the source of post-disaster inequities, is certainly a legitimate theory, but in many contexts such as the Caribbean, it only forms half the story. We need to understand that intricate relationship between capitalism and colonialism in these contexts um, and how this is being uh, leveraged through uh, compounding and repeatedly poor uh, disaster recovery and reconstruction. Uh, I'm happy to expound upon any of these comments and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Um, I'll hand it off to Anders. Okay, thank you. Hello everybody. So my name is Ander Aldikana. I am research collaborator at the Laboratory of Urban Sociology at the FSL in Switzerland. And together with Professor Vincent Kaufman, I co-authored a paper entitled Towards Green Populism, Right-Wing Populism and Metropolization in Switzerland. The paper is based on an empirical investigation of anti-immigration popular initiatives in Switzerland. The investigation include, included a series of semi-structured interviews with representatives of the main Swiss politi political parties and an analysis of uh, gray literature, campaign and electoral documents and newspaper articles. And the, the paper makes uh, two main contributions. At the empirical level, the paper establishes a link between right-wing populist narratives in Switzerland and the metropolization process ongoing in this country. The paper shows that problems associated to metropolization, such as urban and infrastructure development, traffic or transformation of the landscape, are now used by uh, right-wing populist movements to justify anti-immigration policies. In order to limit uh, these problems, in order to avoid what they call the megalopolization of Switzerland, they say we need to limit immigration. Immigration is in this way presented by right-wing movement as a threat against Swiss habitat, Swiss environment, Swiss landscape. In this sense, and this is the, the second contribution, uh, the paper introduced at, more, at the more theoretical level, the concept of green populism. Behind the concept, there is the idea that uh, identitarian populist narratives and en environmentalist narratives can increasingly uh, be combined by right-wing populist movements. The combination of populist and environmentalist narratives could help uh, right-wing populist movements to expand their social and electoral support, especially in contexts where environmental concerns, environmental awareness, environmental political culture is, as uh, is the case in Switzerland, well-rooted. In these cases, green populism and this is our hypothesis, could be a very real variant of populism in which the ideas of, for example, proximity, localism, or community are, in, to some extent, re-elaborated. That's for you. Uh, 
Excellent. Thank you, Ander. And thank you to all of our presenters today. I appreciate you keeping your presentations brief, despite the richness and the complexity of your articles and your pieces. You've um, been able to kind of boil them down very nicely while leaving um, plenty of time for questions. Um, I, as you know, I, I've had the chance personally to spend, you know, a fair bit of time with these papers and to um, read them in depth and hearing your comments today, you know, made me think about, you know, certain things that I, I hadn't yet um, considered in your papers, but, you know, I was really struck partly because we have, you know, six of the nine papers represented today in the article. Um, and so we don't have the full subset. So I was sort of able to hear different things in your presentations that, um, you know, that that were sort of distilled by these specific papers. Um, but I, I really saw a certain set of uh, presentations today highlighting this, um, the uh, structuring conditions, the colonialism, the histories of and, and contemporary experiences of colonialism, capitalism, and xenophobia as creating the structuring conditions that allow um, injustices to occur and um, targeted violence against specific groups. Um, but also, you know, on the other side, um, also, you know, the, the forms of resistance and, um, and ways that, um, that counter narratives and counter, um, you know, politics are produced at the scale of the city, at the scale of the, the neighborhood or the favela, um, or at the scale of the community or individual in the case of Roma, Roma stigmatization. And, um, you know, and I was really sort of, um, I don't know, I think I, I was left after hearing this collection of papers with perhaps a, a greater sense of, um, of optimism, perhaps, than I, I did when, um, you know, reading the articles together in the, uh, the issue that um, where I was left sort of more with the consequences of um, of right wing governments, right wing policies, right wing imaginaries in shaping, um, you know, particular um, responses. Uh, another comment that really, um, or another idea that that really struck me both in reading the pieces and and in listening to you today um, is the um, the sort of the complexity of the challenges that are faced by um, you know by specific governments in the context where you were researching and in larger global contexts, but really thinking about the particular challenges posed by COVID, posed by um, climate disasters, posed by large scale migrations or, um, you know, mobile populations and, um, and minority populations within particular contexts. And these are, you know, challenges that operate you know where you know operate and have feel their effects on multiple geopolitical scales entail um uh, sort of policy and programmatic solutions and um and are you know have to be addressed with a particular um sensitivity to the particularly affected populations but the um the sort of the the limitations um that push possible solutions to these challenges through the structures of colonialism, through neoliberal capitalism, and, um, and through sort of xenophobic discourses that limit the possible um, ways that we can respond or that these, you know, the, that these governments can respond to the, the complex challenges. A, uh, those are some comments that, you know, just a, a couple of things that have struck me while listening to the paper. And as I begin to collect um, questions and answers, uh, questions from the audience that I can pose to the presenters today, um, you know, I'm, I invite the speakers to respond to some of those questions and whether some of those ideas resonate with their papers. But I also have a more specific question that I would like to pose to the presenters really about the, the research process. Um, in, in, in many cases, the research in which you were conducting um, this, the, the studies for these papers um, are contexts in which um, there are limitations on academic freedoms, on um, freedom of speech, 
on um, on you know kind of the types of critiques um, that you're making in your papers um, a real resistance and um, and limitation of the opportunities to make those critiques and I wonder um, you know in your research sites how you personally as researchers kind of navigated um, the explicit um, restrictions, as well as the more implicit um, concerns that are raised, particularly because, you know, you do research, you know, some of you may, you know, live and, and you, know, op, you know, be in these contexts frequently, or um, to, you hope to return to continue further research. And, um, and I'm, I'm really curious to hear how you navigate contexts that are not um, political contexts that are not receptive to the types of critiques that you are making in your research. So um, I, I think that a good way to um, proceed just logistically is um, I, in, I will invite each of the panelists in the order that was presented um, to offer any comments either to my question to my comments or anything that really struck you while listening to your co panelists presentations and so after everyone has a chance to respond briefly um, at that point I, I would like to turn to audience questions so please audience members I know we have a, a fairly small but definitely engaged crowd so please do um, you know pose your questions I would I would love to pose them to our authors so returning back to the um, to the to the order of presentation I'd like to invite Nina to first um, speak to the questions yeah and I also want to open up space for Jamie my co-author to, to respond at this time too um, I guess I'll just respond a little bit to, to your second um, question, Liza. I think for us, we were we were invested in tracing these kind of right wing imaginaries, which I think is it has its own kind of difficult, it's, it, it presents its own difficulties in terms of method. And so kind of, Jamie and I made kind of the explicit decision to really think about how imaginaries are articulated in, in digital spaces and in kind of public space as a way to kind of get around some of the gatekeeping that happens when you're kind of trying to do some of this work. Um, but it opened up a lot of really fun, it, it, yeah, like kind of fun and creative way of kind of putting a lot of these um, sources together and kind of, as I mentioned earlier, building on a lot of the great ethnographic research that exists, particularly in Honduras, around attempts to kind of instantiate these charter cities in practice. And kind of a lot of this research in particular has been done by early career scholars. So it was a really great opportunity to kind of uplift and center that research without kind of trying to redo it um, as part of you know the efforts of, of kind of writing this piece. Jamie, I'll, I'll pass it over to you for, for some thoughts. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Nina. Um, yeah, I think Nina puts it well there. The um, ethnographic work in Honduras was in some respects the starting point or point of departure for our um, project. Um, which was done in pre-COVID times, but um, in a situation where neither of us were in the same country when we were working on the paper. Um, and so we, in a sense, we were, um, uh, we were follow, working in this network space uh, inhabited by, um, uh, uh, by these neoliberal uh, actors and organizations, uh, which leave a lot of traces behind. So there's a lot to, um, there's a lot that you can, there's a lot of breadcrumbs left behind uh, of these actors so you can follow them into these spaces um most of them are not uh, especially modest about their claims either so um in a sense we were operating by following uh, some of these actors in plain sight uh, as they tried to evade uh resistance and pushback against their projects in some respects charter cities is a is a classic example of trying to work around resistance by um identifying so-called greenfield uh, empty spaces uh, to build new projects uh, uh, and that fails repeatedly which is I think a, an important story to tell it uh, actually fails in its own terms as well as meeting uh, resistance against it uh, so I'll, I'll pass on to the next paper excellent thank you Jamie and Nina Ryan I invite you to respond yeah thanks um I think um my colleagues probably would have something to say on the, the challenge of navigating political contexts. Um, uh, so I'll pass over to um, 
to Vaklav, um, and for that, but just to say briefly, actually, there's a connection here to some ongoing work I'm involved in on migrants in um, an English context. And that's quite striking. You realize very quickly that um, you're working with organizations at a kind of urban, at the urban level, the neighborhood level, who are in many respects um, in complete opposition to government, um, where the the two goals and um, the discourses are completely going in the other, other direction. That's, um, I think, increasingly something um, we as researchers are, are navigating that kind of mismatch. And I know one of the other papers that um, from Berkeley that couldn't be here here tonight um, kind of addresses that. But over to you, Vaclav, or, or, or whoever. Sure, sure. Um, well, I don't think uh, that there was any challenge in terms of research in Roma. And uh, basically, my experience is that uh, the position of the powerful as regards Roma and researchers who engage with the issues that concern Roma is first uh, ignorance. They pretend that we don't exist. And if they do, they are even quite ready to accept you and invite you to some, I don't know, meetings and conferences, but of course, nothing really important comes out of this. And I hoped that I will, I would not bring this issue here, but I can't help myself. We can see how, how, uh, Ter how stupid the situation really is because in Czechia right now, and of course I'm proud uh, about it, we see uh, a great solidarity towards migrants, refugees from Ukraine, of course. But at the same time, it is very shameful experience because many things that we demanded, like uh, affordable housing, uh, I don't know, even some basic solidarity, it was simply denied to, not to us as researchers, but to those people who really need this. Uh, so at this moment, I feel very confused. My feelings are quite mixed. And uh, I guess that's that's all I can contribute right now. I'm sorry. No, I, I thank you for sharing that, Vaclav. I think that was um, extremely useful. Um, would any of the other authors who um, are part of this paper, Remus and Peter, um, yes. uh, Remus, you uh, unmuted first. So I will yes, start with you. I, I had some challenges with the Roma people because I'm working with Roma for 20 years or so. And uh, I published some papers uh, basing on the data I collected, uh, talking to them. Uh, the major issue is they, uh, did not like to be registered. Uh, <laughs> when you take them an interview or a discussion with them, they are very reluctant and they say, oh, you are a securist, you are, you are from Securitate, Romanian time, Romanian back communism is in their mind. And uh, in, uh, in communism, uh, all uh, Roma people uh, were afraid of the state and the Securitate, the, the, the secret police. And so this remained in their mind, and it, it is very difficult to, to register their, their voice, you know, that, that's a challenge. And another one is uh, some of them uh, do not know uh, well Romanian language, and then I had to brought with me a Roma friend and to translate. That that's was another challenge which I faced. But they, they are very nice people, they are, they are like us, and, and uh, I don't know, uh, still the Romanian community and in general Europeans still stigmatize them as, uh, as they are. It's a pity. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Uh, yeah, a lot of was said, but uh, I would say uh, I, don't uh, uh, I don't agree with Vaslav, we didn't uh, uh face some kind of uh, complication but like i would like to maybe just one fun fact uh, because our research uh, which uh, we used uh, in the article and uh, which we are built the arguments on uh is was was funded from uh, by ministry of interior of the czech republic 
who was one of the proponent of this like administrative and security discourse uh, in the Czech Republic against Roma. It was kind of racialized and so on. And uh, uh, when we asked for that uh, for the project, we were thinking how to uh, how to complete uh, how to complete the proposal. Uh, so we used uh, basically the security discourse uh, of the of the Czech state of the Ministry of Interior, which is proponent of that, uh, for uh, like somehow to uh, to overshadow the like our social harm perspective behind the project because we wanted to research the victimization of uh, Roma people uh, living in segregated areas, but it has it wouldn't have been uh, funded, never. Uh, in the case, we wouldn't use uh, the security discourse uh, full of terms with security risks, uh, prevention, uh, and so on. So we a bit, um, let's say, uh, we fucked up with uh, the discourse, and uh, use it for our uh, use it for our efforts. So uh, and for our for our needs. So if it is something uh, you wanted to hear, so we kind of navigated the research around uh, along the discourses. So this is it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think that that kind of sort of not bait and switch as, as explicit as that, but, you know, sanitized, you know, research questions and, and framings that are appealing to funders um, is something that academics have to do, um, particularly in contexts that are more politically sensitive. And, um, and I think that um, a lot of people navigate those in, um, you know, particular ways, and we don't always talk about those. And um, so I appreciate you sharing that with us. I would like to invite Louisa and Andrew um, to to chime in now on any thoughts that this conversation has generated for them. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to invite you to respond. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. Um, you know, from the perspective of an intervention, uh, we didn't do empirical research for this particular project, but what we were trying to do instead was represent the consensus or the discourse that happened at this mini conference at the American Collegiate Schools of Planning. And I think I would be remiss to not mention the chilling effect since then of the discourse around critical race theory and the silencing of academic voices in North American context. And I think that, um, you know, we have been, um, I feel as, as someone who teaches in an urban enclave in the Northeast, very much free to teach about structural racism and to teach about racial capitalism and to teach about, you know, inequality. Uh, but I know that many of my colleagues around the country are fearful um, of the ability to speak freely about these issues in their classrooms and in their writing. Um, and I think that, that that chilling effect is being felt more widely in the aftermath and the sort of backlash against the racial reckoning that happened in 2020 and 2021. Um, following the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, and others. And so I consider myself very lucky to feel free, both by virtue of my geography and the spatial politics of my university, and also by having tenure. Um, and I know that that's not true for many people with a contingency of academic labor. Um, and I recall just one example from the uh, conversations we were having um, at our mini conference now five or six years ago, where one faculty member who taught in the, in the central United States was telling me that his students would bring in in their academic papers as evidence, um, uh, evidence from neo-Nazi websites, that they were on right-wing and hardcore alt-right and, and, and traditional right-wing websites uh, pulling evidence and they didn't even have the ability or the discursive insight to kind of like know that their sources were coming from this, these places. And these were just sources that were in their environment uh, and in their reading diet. And so I just think really um, carefully now about the ability that some of us have in the, the uneven sort of geography of free academic expression when it comes to um, the chilling effect of, of discourses in, in North America. Luisa, did you wanna add? No, I think that does well. Well put. Uh, well, if anything, just say that uh, within our group of authors, uh, we had a, a Brazilian, a Colombian, Puerto Rican, American, and 
Andrew, I don't know how you define it, but um, it was interesting. Uh, it was an interesting collaboration, also an opportunity to draw from from these different uh, contexts and uh, and respond to the realities of these uh, different places as we were trying to make sense, for instance, of why um, cities that were strong electors of the Workers Party in uh, in Brazil would suddenly uh, switch to support a right wing. Uh, president, right? So these were some of the questions we, uh, yeah, we we discussed, and uh, yeah, and so we we benefited from these uh, really interesting, I would say, interdisciplinary, transnational uh, view, just uh, working across, uh, yeah, across places. Yeah, absolutely. And hearing um, sort of the the two of you speak, Andrew and Luisa, um, it's an important reminder of how important these um, the spaces where we can get together and discuss these things with colleagues, be able to talk across contexts, are so important and um, but not equally available to everyone given increasingly uneven geographies of sort of free academic discourse and restrictions. Um, before we um, move on um, to Abigail, I would like to invite um, the audience members to post questions um, in the Q&A, and I would love to um, be able to uh, pose some of your questions to the panelists following their presentations uh, or their, their comments. Abigail? Yeah, thanks so much, Liza. So I think the question is really interesting about the political context. And in, in my case, the paper was about community, the community. So they were very happy to talk to me. Um, and by the way, this was um, you know done in post-2020. So this was online and asynchronous and using WhatsApp and Skype and different forms of media. But um, an interesting kind of political dimension to it, because I actually didn't have challenges because I was speaking to communities I knew and were also very communities who wanted to have their uh, kind of message heard as well. But um, all friends of mine who were in uh, Rio or in Sao Paulo or there during the pandemic also told me that um, there was a real hesitancy of communities to actually talk to researchers um, during the pandemic, especially because of the stance of Bolsonaro and how that would be perceived as sort of supporting him because you don't support social isolation. So had I been in Brazil, I'm not sure I would have actually done the research. So it, it the kind of methodology opened a lot of possible, like new opportunities for me to think about doing something like that. Um, I had done something of the sort before, but not in such an intensive way especially using WhatsApp and, you know, you know, so this was really interesting having politicians talk to me via WhatsApp. Um, so super interesting. And I became a bit more interested in, in, in that aspect, but I think it's really important to keep in mind the political, like the access issue and how, you know, how these kind of mediate what the kind of research we can do. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I'm just fascinated by your comment that um, that even speaking to you would have been, you know, a, an implicit acceptance of Bolsonaro's policies because of the, the, the interpersonal contact and you know, avoidance or, or ignoring of restrictions. Um, and, and I'm also struck and I, you know, I think yours is one of the few papers that was conducted where the research was conducted um, since COVID um, to think about how the methodologies that we've had to utilize and how we've had to, um, you know, sort of pivot um, and, and what the implications of that are going to be in the long run for the kinds of questions, particularly as political contexts um, seem to be increasingly fraught um, for doing this research and, and, and where there might be new opportunities through the digital, through the wide, more widespread use of digital tools for research. Excellent. Um, uh, Danielle, I would like to invite your comments. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think for, for my own research on this piece, I think it was less um, a concern about actually conducting the research. There are, of course, data transparency issues in Puerto Rico. Oftentimes, if you're going to do work there, you have to collect and create the data yourself because um, the uh, government doesn't really like to share its information. But um, 
one issue I had was actually in the reporting of the data. And I know a lot of other Puerto Rican scholars who have this problem where um, you want to talk about the realisms of our histories and our theories. But once you start to do so, it's seen, you know, depending on how you're framing your work as um, sort of an argument for what our status should be. Um, are we, you know, speaking from you know, wanting to um, advocate for statehood or for independence for this piece, you know, writing um, so explicitly about colonization and coloniality in Puerto Rico. Um, I've been seen as an apologist for, you know, pro-independence movements. And it's interesting because I never said anything about its status in my own opinions. Um, but that's just sort of the reality in Puerto Rico is, you know, if you really try to talk about these issues, it's instantly tied to this highly, highly politicized debate about our status. Um, and I think that's that's very difficult, especially in the US. There are a lot of Americans that don't want to admit what's going on in Puerto Rico. Um, they don't see the history. Um, you know, how did Puerto Rico become part of the US? And just looking at that history and that war and what happened, uh, I think is very, you know, telling of what our current situation is. And so I think it it's not so much the research side of it, but it's always for for people, you know, researching Puerto Rico, it's always in the reporting. And oftentimes what I see is we have a conversation as Puerto Rican scholars behind doors. And then there's the conversation when we're publishing, oftentimes we sanitize um, the story just to try and get away from that politicization. And I didn't do that with this piece. <laughs> I wanted to speak very freely about it. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. <laughs> well, I, I, I do have to say, I appreciate you speaking so freely. And I remember first reading the piece at your, when you submitted it, just being really excited by your frankness and by your willingness to speak truths that are often left unsaid. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Ander, I'd like to invite your comments. So uh, we have not really uh, a lot of challenge in, in Switzerland uh, to conduct the research. So I think we are in, in another context, political context, social context, where we have access to the, for example, uh, to the representative of the Swiss People Party, to the uh, people from the Ticino Liga. So it was from the point of view of the access to the, to the field, there was no problem. Uh, what is what I think it was interesting in the in the paper and in the research process. It it was that um, I I am Spanish. I'm from Spain. I was uh, in Switzerland uh, for a couple of years, and so I was like a a kind of immigrant with some curiosity in the in the country. And then uh, the co-author, who is uh, Professor Vincent Kaufman, has had the, the authority a little bit of the uh, knowledge of the Swiss uh, politics, of the Swiss uh, society. So the combination of two um, researchers, one who has the curiosity of one country, which is uh, new, for me it was uh, absolutely, uh, everything was new, and the, I say, I would say the the knowledge, this experience of the country of this uh, co-author of uh, Professor Van Van Kaufman, this combination I think was critical to 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 to, to create to 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 work on on the paper. For, for I think for us this was a, a very yes a very interesting thing, and I think that uh, both uh, helped or both were able to help uh, each other in, in order to, to, to conduct the research and, and at the end uh, write and publish the paper. Thank you for that. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, and I would like to once again invite audience members to ask questions, but I'd also like to invite panelists to ask questions to one another. Um, sort of in that spirit. Um, I had a question for you, Ander, while you're still spotlit at this moment. Um, I 
first of all, I, I find your paper really interesting because of new political alignments and new political configurations that your um, that your paper points to. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about the implications of this green populism for um, potential unlikely, perhaps unlikely, um, solidarities or coalitions emerging between right and left, or whether the kind of green populism you're identifying remains sort of politically quite separate from more left-wing environmentalist movements within the Swiss context. Thank you for the question. I think is the the kind of comment that you made in the past to push us uh, further or uh, to develop uh, further the the concept of a uh, green populism. And I have not, I have not really uh, more uh, elements. Uh, what I can say related to this uh, case in Switzerland is that. Um, this combination of, of this, this combination of populism narratives and, and environmental narratives is also possible in other contexts. I think uh, this is something that I understand in the last month that it is possible to see this combination of green populism, uh, the, of uh, identitarian populism, and environmental populism in other context, context that is not only something that uh, happens in Switzerland. And I, I, I consider this green populism like uh, a, a variant of actual populism. That's, that is my idea, my hypothesis, but I have not really more elements. I, I know that this was the one of the comments you, you that you proposed when we were uh, elaborating the paper, but I have no really more more than. Thank you for that. I uh, I, <laughs> I I apologize for my repetition, but uh, it sort of struck me as though it was a fresh question today <laughs> when you remind me that it perhaps may not have been quite so fresh. Um, I wonder um, if I could turn a question um, to Nina and Jamie um, to ask to, but others, I, I want to also encourage others to jump in and, and ask, but what the, the meaning of imaginaries is in this context, because I think this idea of imagination, and you both spoke about this in your last set of comments, but um, this notion of an imagination um, is something that, you know, reading all of the papers together, I was thinking quite a bit about that, you know, what sort of is enabled or what possibilities are foreclosed by the imaginaries that we conceptualize for the set of possibilities. Um, and I wonder if thinking about right wing imaginaries that are sort of brought to the fore through Paul Romer's um, charter city model could also be used to kind of think about the right wing imaginaries that create and limit the set of possibilities um, in other contexts as well. So um, Nina, Jamie, I, I wonder if you have anything more that you can say about um, kind of this notion of imaginaries and how they operate. And if this notion resonates for others to please feel free to jump in. Yeah, um, uh, there's a couple of points I'd, I'd make about that. Um, one is, uh, I mean, the, the focus of our paper um, is in many ways on uh, what, what I would still call a neoliberal imaginary, which um, uh, certainly isn't exclusively right wing. It's, um, its characteristics are, uh, are that it's extremely kind of persistent and, and occupies quite a lot of the mainstream. I mean, it's, it's striking um, that what's, what um, we felt were you know, borderline crazy ideas about annexing uh, large areas of land and building brand new cities of 10 million people um, were indulged so much by the New York Times and, uh, and quality media um, 
uh, and, and there's easy access to that for uh, many of these uh, kinds of arguments. So the, the, it, it, it's quite heterogeneous and it, you can trace the hard core of these ideas to um, some quite strange circuits of, of libertarian um, uh, uh, politics, but at the same time, it lives in neoclassical economics uh, and uh, the winners of the Nobel Prize, and, and this it, it is broadly sprawling across um, uh, uh, the political spectrum. So it, it was partly about how um, how broadly uh, consumed those messages were and reciprocated in in quotes mainstream uh, uh, circles. Second point I would say is the kind of the, the starting point for our paper is uh, ongoing work in Hong Kong, um, from which we're um, still excluded for uh, all kinds of uh, COVID related reasons for possibly at least another year. Um, but Hong Kong is a is a the starting point for our work there was because of the persistence of this imagination of a, a kind of free market island which never existed in Hong Kong in those terms either. It's a, it's a fantasy of, um, of Milton Friedman and, and others on the right, uh, but has passed into general usage. Um, and, that, and that mythology of Hong Kong, uh, where the imaginary is secured by a, an idealized image of the past, um, becomes quite a powerful sort of geographical metaphor that's repeatedly reused. So, the the the, uh, the clues that we used to trip to follow these networks were the references to Hong Kong in Latin America. You know, where did these references come up? Who was using the reference? How were they using the reference? Invariably, it was with this idealized image in mind. So there's something about the um, the persistence of of those geographically indexed uh, uh, imaginaries. Uh, and the way that they kind of live in the um, um, in the networks of the right and the mainstream uh, that I think um, we tried to bring out in our paper. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nina, would you like to add anything to that? Just to say that you know the libertarian kind of actors that Jamie references are also located in Latin America. So another interesting part of this project was seeing kind of how these networks exist across these wide geographies. And I guess the last thing I'll say, and it's something I talked about earlier, is that another important part of these imaginaries is the way they touch down in practice. And I think it's really telling that, you know, countries like Honduras, for example, become sites of experimentation um, because they're kind of framed as such kind of corrupt and violent contexts. So if a charter city can work there, it can work anywhere, right? So it's, a, it's, it's really important to think about the ways in which these imaginaries kind of, um, yeah, our, you know, our attempt, the attempts at instantiating them and where where that happens versus kind of where the ideas are kind of coming from and being created. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if anyone else wants to um, chime in on this notion of imaginaries. Ryan. No, sorry, it wasn't on that, um, um, the imaginaries, but um, just all the questions in the Q&A yeah. um, book. So um, there's, there's a question, I think it's, it's for all of us, but about how, um, we might promote a more equitable horizontal network of academic knowledge production and decolonization. I think that's a really hugely important and fundamental question and a really interesting question about whether it's only those in politically safe spaces that are, are able to do that. And I haven't got an answer to that question, but what did come to mind is the work, uh, the more recent work over the last kind of 15, 20 years of um, Romani feminist um, scholars and their work and their um, kind of navigation of this um, feminist perspective while being proudly Roma at times and the kind of um, dilemmas and challenges that they're faced with, I think is a useful um, um, well, set of, of debates and literature in, in, in response to that very very difficult and important question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
piggybacking on that on on uh, Hume's question, but also um, your answer, um, would anybody else like to um, to to weigh in on this question? I mean, I think that this is the idea of the political context of knowledge construction and the ways in which. Um, certain voices are privileged because of the safety and security of the authors, um, you know, who, who feel they're able to speak and who's willing to take the risks. And I think, you know, Ryan's highlighting, you know, and, and really kind of shining a light on um, feminist Roma authors is um, really important to note. Does anybody um, else, you know, feel free to use the um, raise hand um, feature, but I think we are also um, a small enough group that I can see you. Um, if you just unmute yourself, we can, I can handle some, some traffic um, policing in this regard. Any, anybody else would like to chime in on this particular question? Yeah, I could chime in just real Quick, I thought the question was very interesting and it made me consider, you know, at what point do the risks of doing some of this work outweigh what's happening on the ground and gets to the point where some people are sort of forced to speak. Um, so I think that can happen as well if we're not, you know, protecting academics and journalists from being able to speak out about what's happening in some of these contexts, it will get to a point where people will have to put themselves sort of in the line of fire. Um, I see that a lot with, you know, in disaster situations, post-disaster situations, or um, with climate change, that some people are sort of forced into speaking out about these issues, and particularly, you know, disaster uh, recovery and reconstruction processes. And so I think there's also another flip, I don't know if this is answering the question or just adding like another flip side to it to consider. Yeah, I appreciate that flip side because, you know, there's the privilege um, to remain silent as well, or to not, to choose not to speak that um, may not be as afforded to everyone equally. And I think it's important to include that in the conversation as well. Um, I, I would like to, to uh, put Abigail on the spot a little. We have a couple of questions about the context of Brazil, specifically the first question about um, what the meaning of Lula's return to politics might be for Brazil's political landscape and for populism more broadly, um, but then also um, you know, to, to ask about um, insurgent citizenship and planning um, as disjunctive, um, but thinking about the, the negligence of the state um, and, um, and the state-like roles that communities must take on in response. Um, you know, at what point are we talking about disjunctive democracy or perhaps not democracy at all any longer? So, I mean, you have the, the exact wording of the questions available to you as well, but, but I'd love to hear from you, Abigail. Well, I, I mean, uh, maybe I'll answer them together, uh, both questions together. I mean, I don't know what will happen in Brazil, obviously, um, but I guess, especially like looking back at history, I mean, there have been blips of populism and then so ups and downs and lately very rocky. So I guess the return of Lula, who, who knows what it, I don't really know. I mean, I'm not a, I can't see the future, but I would hope that things are better uh look better in the future but i i don't hope i mean i don't know if that will be that quick because it's been uh so many different challenges as far as this disjunctive democracy i think when i talk about state like roles of communities i don't mean that they should be doing those things i just mean that they're stepping in 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 this context that's really terrible so i don't kind of equate them and i don't think that i I guess I'm talking about a particular context, which is the pandemic. Um, so I don't necessarily think that these should be long lasting at, uh, at all. So I, I don't equate them, but, uh, but really uh, interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if I can kind of pose the same question that Ab Abigail just um, responded to, to Louisa and Andrew, perhaps. I mean, this idea of, activists, um, practitioners who, you know, may be working as part of administration or, or bureaucracy as urban planners or as in other capacities, but taking on roles that they might not 
necessarily be charged to do so in democratic contexts, whether you have some concerns about the possibilities for democracy as um, we, we see sort of, you know, groups and individuals taking on new roles in democratic contexts. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, uh, so some of the um, things I've been paying attention to relate to the rise, uh, just in the context here of Canada and the US, uh, of NIMBYs, but also YIMBYs, and the expectation that planning practitioners need to pay attention to both. Uh, and it's been a really interesting debate uh, when we consider that, uh, yeah, like the amount of tactics that, that groups use to mobilize uh, in public engagement settings, in these spaces of consultation. Uh, so traditionally for urban practitioners, uh, the, the consultation has worked as a particip participatory setting uh, meant to actually try to balance uh, interest. And uh, for planners, we talk a lot about the public interest and the role of the planner uh, in aiming for uh, equity outcomes and trying to highlight silenced voices that we wouldn't hear otherwise. And so as a planning educator, that's a, a big chunk of the planning education that we do is trying to figure out uh, how can uh, communities or, or people who are traditionally marginalized can participate uh, in these scenarios and understand the, the politics of uh, urban change. Um, so it considered uh, in light of uh, populism and uh, the issues we've been discussing today, I think that, uh, yeah, like the, the, the prevalence of uh, NIMBY techniques, but also the, the GIMBYs and how they are often uh, showed as if they were uh, intentioned yet both uh, are pretty much grounded on defending uh, private interests in a particular way. Um, it's it's traveling. I don't know if I'm <laughs> responding to your question, uh, but that's just something that uh, that came to mind. And what can practitioners do to encourage more um, inclusive environments? What's one of the questions that we discussed at length, and definitely. Uh, yeah, so there are all these assumptions about cities being these spaces for uh, for building um, communication across difference and for uh, yeah create, creating like these more hopeful uh, encounters. Um, yet, uh, and then we see a role for urban practitioners uh, trying to facilitate also through. Uh, I guess uh, a particular set of, of infrastructure of solidarity, but yeah, but that is a really interesting question. And if anything, that is our weak weak spot <laughs> in our paper. Uh, Andrew, would you like to to complement to add to that? Um, I'd actually like to return to the previous question about academic knowledge production and safety. Um, you know, I I teach a course on civic engagement and participatory planning. Um, where we have both uh, students from my university and, and community residents taking the course side by side in a community engaged learning format. And uh, as such, what we try to do is encourage them to, to uh, increase their community change capacity to do kind of community organizing and community change work. And we try to expose them to a variety of practitioners who are doing this work in real time. And one of the groups that we brought into the classroom just this past week was a panel of investigative journalists. And there are some interesting parallels between academic researchers and investigative journalists. And I, I don't think I'm the first person to say that, uh, but one of the things the journalists spoke to our students about was the challenge of working with marginalized and traumatized populations. Um, that they are basically equipped with no training as reporters and they go out into the field and somebody's been victim of a fire or a shooting or a natural disaster or you know, a human-made disaster, and they sort of stick a microphone in their face and say, how does this make you feel? Um, and one of the things that I think we ought to examine as these reporters were calling for is some training um, for academics in how to respond in a sort of trauma-informed uh, praxis so that when we go and encounter people who have faced tremendous difficulty 
um, we know some of the buttons not to push and some of the sort of approaches to take. Um, and I don't think we can rely on the training that we get in our PhD programs uh, to, to help us kind of encounter folks who've been through tremendous difficulty. And so I was taking a cue from my colleagues in investigative journalism who do are beginning to get training in this um, for, for their work. And I just thought it would be very important for us to consider the possibilities for the academy to uh, think about how to encounter subjects who are in distress. I really appreciate you sharing that, um, Andrew. I think this idea of a trauma-informed praxis is something that I'm gonna be left thinking about and thinking about how we can um, possibly um, do better in training PhD students and our own selves about you know, how to um, approach you know, um, research subjects informants, uh, participants in this way. So we are at time and I would um, love to continue this conversation, but I'm also mindful of people's time. So I would like to thank very much the, the panelists for taking time and sharing um, more about your papers with us today. I would like to thank the, um, the uh, audience for joining us on a busy day and across many time zones, wherever, you know, whatever time it is that you're chiming in. I would really like to thank Eshna Badruzaman, um, the web content producer uh, for IGER, for really helping kind of organize all of the behind the scenes work for this um, and has done an, an exemplary job. I'd like to thank my co-editors and the editorial board of IGER and, um, and, and hopefully this conversation can continue in many ways. So I'm going to end the meeting now, but thank you um, for, for being part of it. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.